welcome back to uh, my fireside chat with senior executives experienced in corporate venturing. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Raj Singh, who is the uh, Managing Director, Head of Investments at JetBlue Technology Ventures, based in Palo Alto, with uh, over 25 years in experience in innovation in the IT sector. Raj, thank you very much for making time. Always a pleasure to have our alumni come back for a, a conversation. Yeah, um, very uh, honored to be invited, Claudia. Thank you very much and uh, a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you for sharing your experience. So to kick things off, if I would ask you about looking back over the last 10, 15 years in the space that you've been in, the good, the bad and the ugly about uh, corporate venture capital or corporate venturing, what would you say? Um, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, the good, I would say, is that potentially corporate venture has the potential to be the best form of venture, um, including all the institutional VCs that are out there and other forms as well. Uh, corporate venture could be the best. Um, the bad is that it's far from that right now. And um, you know, we as an industry need to better grasp how to play this game. We're playing somebody else's game and we need to improve. Uh, uh, so we could be um, you know, considered to be basketball players trying to play soccer. And uh, if we do that, it won't go well. Um, the ugly, I think, is that the whole venture industry is due a radical rethink. Um, I, would, uh, I would posit that a lot of the returns in classical venture come from luck more than anything else, um, come from the economic cycle more than anything else. So if we as an industry want to improve, we're going to have to work out how to get better at that. So thank you. That is, that, that, that's quite a bit of food for thought, but we'll circle back to that and we'll kind of try to peel the onion away now a little bit more. In one of our earlier conversations, you um, highlighted that the industry of the parent has a huge impact on CBC, on the mandate, on the role and the focus of the CBC uh, vehicle. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think um, the way that uh, new players come to the industry is by being very similar to the industry itself. So those players who were in the high tech industry initially, setting up CVC units was relatively easy because the targets, the startups they wanted to invest in and the products that they were interested in were very similar to what they understood already. And so for those guys to enter the industry was relatively easy. Likewise for financial services players and for biotech players. But as you get further away from the classic high-tech industries, it becomes um, a different story. And so if you are in agriculture, if you are in um, industrial manufacturing, um, if you are in a uh, labor-intensive um, industry rather than a technology-intensive industry, how do you manage to take advantage of the venture paradigm, the venture industry? And so depending on your industry and depending on um, uh, how far or close you are to how VC works today, you're going to have to adapt. And so this is my, uh, my uh, point, is that um, you know, which industry you're in will have a big impact on the sorts of things that you might focus on. Uh, if we take an example of an industry that is um, manufacturing, um, now it may be that there are relatively few startups out there that are focused on the manufacturing process itself. And so for you as a CVC, when thinking about sourcing innovation using uh, venture, you'll have to think about not only your core processes, but the subsidiary processes. It may be that you start off by thinking about the ancillary products that go around your product, the services, um, the aftercare support, the ancillary sales. Perhaps those are the areas that you start to innovate um, whilst keeping a lookout for your core processes. So, um, you know, this has never been more true, I would say, than 2020, um, where my industry, the travel industry, has experienced huge disruption for um, obviously the reason of the pandemic. And so that has had a very large impact 
on the way that we have been thinking about CBC. So whereas we have um, traditionally, I say traditionally, our group's only been going five years, but we have uh, tended to focus on a broad range of horizons, both the near term, the medium, but also the moonshot, the far long term out uh, types of uh, bets. Um, we focused on those, but in 2020, our horizons collapsed towards the immediate. Why was that? Because we understood that in order for our industry to survive, we needed to find solutions that could be implemented more or less immediately. Um, how do we convince customers that it's safe to get on the plane? How do we ensure that um, you know, the planes are clean? Um, how do we ensure that the touch points that a customer has to go through to go through their journey are reduced? So that's kind of the examples I'm thinking of when I say that your industry makes a huge difference to the way that you approach CBC. Yeah. So corporates often struggle, though, with the objective of their CBC units. For new business units, um, it's clear. For CBC, it's kind of hard to uh, define them. Um, can you comment on that? I mean, what's potentially a good way of circling the wagons and creating a clear mandate for a CBC? Yes, I think this is a very important issue because um, you know most of us as corporations are driven by the profit metric. So if a, a business unit is returning profits, that's great. And if it isn't, what do we do about it? So when, uh, when any corporation starts a new line of business, they'll always be thinking about, you know, what am I doing here? What's the purpose of this? What can I expect to see out of this in the, you know, one, three, five, 10 year five timeline, whatever it is that they're focusing on. When they start a corporate venture capital unit, those questions are harder to answer. And so sometimes they don't answer them. What they say is, oh, you know, we're doing this in order for, um, to receive strategic benefits. Um, well, what is strategic benefit and how do you measure that? Um, some of them say we are looking for financial upside. So we want to invest in startups and ultimately those startups should return, you know, a hundred times the value uh, that we put into them. So um, that kind of defines the spectrum of how people are thinking about it. Strategic at one end, financial at the other end. And the reality is, of course, more nuanced than that. Um, so going back to first principles, when you start up a new business unit, what are its objectives? Um, you know, it's a truism in our industry that the average uh, corporate venture unit lasts about four years. Um, and if you look at that, one of the reasons is that we have economic cycles. Uh, another reason is that um, senior management doesn't tend to last much longer than that. So the average tenure of a CEO is relatively short. When the new CEO comes in, she's often motivated to look for changes as a way of making her mark, but also as a, um, a way of going towards the strategy that she has in mind. Mm -hmm. So um, it's important for them to make a change. And sometimes you look at the CBC unit and you say, well, what have these guys done for me? Going back to the objectives, it's hard to say. And so they become an easy target. Now, uh, in our case at uh, JetBlue Technology Ventures, you know, we think of ourselves as having a strategic impact. And how do we measure that? We measure it in a couple of ways. And, you know, let me be honest, um, you know, I won't say that the ways that we measure are perfect, nothing close to that, in fact, but nevertheless, measurements they are. And you know how it is uh, in, uh, in industry. Um, if you measure people, they will play the game and try and maximize against the measurements. So in our case, the measurements are how many companies do we invest in that eventually become suppliers to the parent company. Um, so, you know, we are really looking for distinguished innovation that we couldn't have come up with ourselves that will help us power the products and services that we can pass on to our customers. So um, if I can bring in 10 investments a year and five or more of those eventually become a supplier, that I think is um, right on track. Um, moreover, I will then look at the business case that the parent company has to develop in order to bring on a new supplier. And I will measure against that business case. Did we deliver additional revenue, additional profit above and beyond uh, what might have been delivered without the startup? And if we did, then again, we're delivering value. 
Um, so, you know, these are the two key metrics that we me that we measure. There are some other subsidiary metrics which are around the knowledge base that we've helped develop back at base. So. Um, I read a statistic somewhere that um, the age of your doctor has an impact on the type of prognosis you will receive and the type of um, uh, cure that you will be prescribed because doctors are very busy. They often don't have time to find out about the latest technology um, yeah. in their field. And they often may be uh, wary of it because they're not familiar with it. Likewise, for most industries, those practitioners sometimes do not have time to look around them and see what's happening. So one of the metrics that we have as a subsidiary goal is informing people within our organization of what is innovation in their field and allowing them to participate in that internal innovation, if you like. Um, so those are the metrics that we use. As I say, not perfect, but um, coming back to the strategic versus financial axis, what you can say now is that we have a strategic goal, which is to do these things, as I've mentioned. The financial aspect may partly be that we need the startups we invest in to be around long enough for us to realize those strategic goals. Mm -hmm. And being around long enough implies success, financial success, else you know, resources will be allocated elsewhere. Uh, so we do measure that. Um, and then the final thing that we think about is, um, you know, I have an exit from a company and maybe I make a hundred million or maybe if I'm lucky, I make more than that on that exit, which is great. JetBlue, um, you know, in normal days uh, is an $8 billion revenue corporation. If I can make 1% increase in that revenue stream, uh, or even let's say two for, for sake of argument, that's $160 million every year. So um, yes, I'd love to have great exits, Give me a couple of percentage points of increased revenue. I'll be very happy with that as well. Mm. You, you just um, an, a follow on question. You touched on engaging your kind of internal business units and, and mm. senior executives. Any thoughts on what you've seen, what kind of works and doesn't work? Because ultimately, I mean, as a CVC, you're going out and pitching yourself to the startups saying, you know, we are we're actually better than a VC because we give you access to some of our business units. What have you seen that kind of works? So what have you what have you used uh, tools to engage those business units? Yeah. Um, so a couple of things. So, you know, I think we're in the third wave of CVC. The first wave was, um, you know, the CEO sending um, a, a trusted advisor to go to Silicon Valley, typically mm. look around for some deals and come back with something. That didn't work because those people were not connected into the industry, uh, the venture industry. The second wave was hire a VC and get them to do that. They have the connections, they have the network. But those people were not able to fully understand what were the goals of the corporation and what were the politics required in order for a, a startup to be successfully integrated as a supplier back into uh, the mothership. Mm -hmm. um, so wave three is where we say, we need a combination of skills. We need people who really understand our industry and our organization, as well as people who understand the VC industry and are connected. That's very rarely one person. Yeah. So you need a group of skills that can do that. The way that we have approached it is by saying, um, what are the objectives of the business units at the parent company? And in JetBlue's case, we are an extremely open organization. We know what each other's objectives are and we share and talk about them. And we have shared goals where we jointly work towards objectives. So what we do is we go and look for those business units who have objectives where we can be helpful. Because let's not pretend that a startup can solve every problem that a large corporation has. It clearly can't. But there are definitely some areas where it can be extremely useful. So go look for those business units that A, have problems that you can solve, and B, are open to working with you. Again, in a large corporation, there will be a range of views. And when you set up a new CVC unit, some people will be in favor of the idea. And some people may feel that those are resources that may have better been deployed with them. Um, they may be less receptive to working with you. So find those friends who have the needs that you can help solve and solve those needs. Um, 
help educate them, go work with them, find out which are the most strategically important and most difficult for them to solve and help them solve those. And once you do that and hopefully get success from that, um, you know, success breeds interest from other business units. So having the people within your organization, your CBC group, that know how your parent company works, um, know how to talk to the people that are there, know how to deliver success for those business units, will inevitably uh, make those other people in the business units that maybe were not initially so keen on working with you, interested in working with you because they will look around and say, well, those guys are doing better uh, than I am. Perhaps it's time for me to engage as well. And so those are kind of the sort of thoughts that we've had um, very openly within the organization. It's not the case that everybody's ready to work with you immediately, and there may be nothing wrong with that. But slowly showing success, proving your worth, um, meeting your goals uh, is a, um, uh, a very attractive thing for other people in the organization. Very good. So now, obviously, you know, as, as a CVC or as a VC, I mean, you, you're operating inside an ecosystem and kind of finding your, your, your space and your place in that ecosystem is crucial. And I mean, as you have seen in the last couple of years, we've had every year new record number of deals and dollars deployed by okay. CVCs into, um, into entrepreneurs. Um, Share, share your thoughts with us on, on, on has, is, is, is the perception of CVC changing? Are you seeing um, different types of entrepreneurs approaching CVC? I mean, just the fact that uh, C, CVCs were able to deploy more and more capital every year, success, successfully and successively, um, is clearly a sign that um, entrepreneurs are more willing to engage with CVCs, which in turn has to mean that CVCs are doing a good job. Is this a fair comment? Mm. I would say caveat investor. Um, okay. So, you know, um, having been an entrepreneur myself, uh, you know, there are a lot of um, wise words around the industry about not just taking the money, um, about looking for investors that add value and have a cultural affinity to the, what, the thing that you're doing and, and the team that you are. The reality is, however, that sometimes you're desperate. And so you'll take money where you can find it. And um, so the increasing volumes alone don't tell me that CVC is being more successful. However, I would agree that we are being more successful. And the reason I would point to is if you look at the types of companies that CVCs have started to invest in, they are the top notch um, startups out there. And so that tells me that those companies where there is, a, frankly, an abundance of money available um, are choosing to work with CVCs. So I do agree with your initial contention that the image of CVC is improving. And I think that what has happened is we've gone through those waves that I referred to earlier. Um, I also think what is happening is that CVCs have, um, have realized their importance or lack of importance in the ecosystem. Uh, what do I mean by that? So imagine, you know, you're a very senior executive at some very important corporation that is in the Fortune 100 or whatever it might be. And you imagine that you're so impressive that pretty much any startup that you went to would be more than happy to work with you. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. Right. Um, you know, startups have a limited amount of time uh, and resources. And unless you're able to move quickly and prove worth, they will move on by nature. They have to. Mm -hmm. And so they're not so impressed and they won't necessarily wait around for you to make a decision. So I think what's happened is that CBCs have understood little by little that they need to look like VCs. They need to make decisions quickly. They need to eliminate a lot of the terms that traditionally they had asked for. Let's say it's exclusivity. Let's say it's the right of first refusal to buy a company because those terms depress the, ultim the ultimate value of the startup. And so those have to go and they have gone. And so I would say that CBCs have become much better 
uh, and that the uh, industry's um, image has improved because of that realization of we're playing somebody else's game. Having said all of that, I would say there are still a number of VCs out there who still have a negative image of CVC. And it is true, there are some CVCs that don't do a great job. But to be honest with you, there are plenty of VCs that don't do a great job either. So, um, you know, I think we are improving. And I think that, um, you know, like any uh, situation, choose your partners wisely. And, you know, there have been some CVCs that have been around for many, many years um, who have excellent reputations and excellent track records. And I think we're seeing more and more of that. But, um, you know, it's, um, it's still a case of choose your investor carefully. Sure. Um, now, CVC in 2020, um, what, what surprised me a little bit was that um, from what I can see right now, and still waiting for the final data to come out for the year, but I don't think there was a slowdown in uh, terms of uh, CVC activity, which is kind of unusual because historically, CVCs have um, traditionally gone back into their shell when crisis hit. So it was basically, okay, you know, we're not doing well, let's go back to core. And core was clearly not CVC. So the corporate parents agenda became basically top of the uh, top of the list again. Um, have you, did you see that as well? And did that surprise you? Uh, I have seen the same thing. Um, I think I was initially a bit uh, surprised, um, but uh, now having thought about it a little bit more, I would say that what I understand is that the, um, the imperative around why you would create a CVC has become so important now. Um, I would say perhaps essential to a lot of businesses that there isn't really a sense that you can slow down. Um, so in a way, um, the innovation that CVCs are bringing to their parents has become core. Um, and you know, we, I think we're all familiar with the pace of change that's happened in, uh, in our industries. Yeah. Um, that pace of change hasn't slowed down despite the pandemic. And so you know, going one level uh, further in, there are obviously a set of industries that have done very well in the pandemic. Um, you know, delivery services, remote services, uh, video conferencing, anything that could have, uh, you know, that has that could benefit from the fact that we're all staying at home. Those those are industries that have done extremely well. I think what has happened also is that um, the concept of digital transformation has become the concept of digital acceleration. So it's no longer a question that you should be thinking about transforming your industry by adding a digital aspect. It is how fast and how quickly can I go down that path? And so, um, you know, if you think of those things, what it says to me is that um, there was an initial pause, I think, in the, you know, the sort of end of the first quarter 2020 when people were evaluating what it is that they should be doing. Um, but then they just came straight back because what they realized is that, well, two things. One is, um, Actually, investing in a downturn is a great idea. Uh, you give the startups that you invest in the time to build the product and service that you're looking for. Um, valuations are probably a little bit depressed, and so that makes sense. Um, and innovative ideas flourish in those environments. Um, and then I think the second thing is that you know companies realize that if they didn't keep on doing what they were doing in terms of finding innovation and deploying it, that when the upturn came, as it inevitably does, um, fortunately, um, they would be behind their competitors that had carried on. So there was um, a, if you like, a sort of competitive element to ensuring that you were not left behind as the, uh, as the upturn came. And I think those factors have outweighed the other factors. Um, the only uh, perhaps um, exception there would be for those industries that um, are, you know, uh, severely suffering, where it is a question of survival as opposed to trying to thrive. And for those industries, I do understand why they may have focused back on the core. But in general, um, I think your point is very well taken. CBCs really, really, you know, put um, uh, wood behind the arrow. Um, and in Previous downturns, they've all retreated, they've disbanded. I think what they've also realized is that um, it takes, you know, people have long memories in this industry. And so it takes a long time to repair your reputation. 
So they've made the decision that they will carry on investing. And I think that's probably the right one. Yeah. So final question um, for our audience, likely senior executives, board members that are right now sitting there and um, thinking through how they should build their corporate venturing units and mm. how to start off. Mm. Two or three comments or points of advice that you would give them, if you could be at that point again and look back. Um, I think first thing is investing in other funds isn't helpful. Um, so a lot of uh, firms think that they'll dip their toe in the water by investing in a fund or two and uh, learning that way. And the reality is that, is that most VC funds are not set up as a way of teaching limited partners what they're doing um, and uh, um, finding them great deals. Uh, they are focused squarely on financial returns. And um, if you're going to do something like that, you know, at least choose a sector a specific fund that you can work with. But in honesty, the best thing that you can do is um, you know, start dabbling. Um, so that would be my first point of advice. Second point of advice would be um, go find the right team to help you. So find somebody from within your organization that really understands the organization and can act as that, um, that liaison between the ventures group and the, uh, the business units. Um, without that, it's very hard to deliver strategic value. Um, and then find um, somebody who understands the industry. Um, and by the industry, I mean the venture industry. Um, that the connection between those two roles will be the pivot around which you can be successful um, because you need to have both skill sets in order for it to work. And then the third thing I would say is go talk to all the others. Um, there are more than 2,000 CVC units out there right now. And there are a number of uh, places where those, those people meet and congregate. There are a number of people in different industries where you can go and find out what worked well and what didn't work well. Should you be taking stakes that are larger than 20%, which may result in you having to roll up a startup's losses into your P&L? Um, should you be taking board seats? What is the situation around should you be focused on strategic or financial alone? Should you be considering acquisitions? Uh, is VC your, your door opener into an acquisition? So all of these questions need to be pondered and a, um, a, a, a vision developed as to what it is you want to do. And if, I, I strongly recommend you go do your homework first because um, you know um, the reality of, um, of VC is that you don't know if you're right or not for a number of years, um, possibly five, you know, normally speaking, seven to 10. And uh, so in order to make sure you're doing things right, it's really helpful to get some experience in there. So um, those would be my uh, you know, top, of the, top of mind types of things to be thinking about. The one thing I would say is that I've yet to discover an industry that couldn't um, use a little bit of uh, CVC help. Um, yeah, there are lots of different ways where you can find innovation internally and externally. I think CVC is right now at least one of the best uh, bets that one has as an additional thing you might do. It doesn't have to necessarily replace other things, but it's a, it's a really good way of finding out what's going on out there um, and getting involved. So it's clearly worthwhile spending a bit of time rolling up your sleeves start dabbling as you called it and don't be shy to reach out to uh, those that are doing it and have done it already for a long time that absolutely and, and people, are, people are willing to talk they absolutely are very good on that note thank you very much that was a fantastic conversation we even went a little bit over time from what we had expected but very much worthwhile really appreciate it raj and uh, i look forward to having you in class when the times are uh, back on campus again maybe in our san francisco campus thanks that very much be wonderful thanks so much Claudia. appreciate the time thank Bye. you very much Bye.